Yeah. I'll, start, I'll start off with that. Yes, certainly. Right? Yeah. The age of realignment. Well, uh, th- thanks very much for having me here. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, I think most of you know me, I'm Steve Davies and I'm the Education Director at the Institute of Economic Affairs here in London. Now, this talk I'm going to give you is really, in a way, two talks. There are actually two separate lectures. Uh, the bulk of the talk is one. There's a bit from another one, which is a kind of historical lecture, which is what the dates refer to. I first gave this talk about uh, three years ago in Washington, D.C., to uh, the Koch Summer Fellows at the Cato Institute. Uh, and I've since given it a couple of times uh, at various other places. And I, you know, there's hardly a day goes by, I think, when I don't find uh, confirmatory uh, instances of my thesis, which maybe fits in with what Bob was just <laughs> talking about. Uh, now, what then is my thesis? Well, my thesis, which I'm going to argue to you, is that here in Britain... Uh, we are about to enter a decade-long process of political realignment, and I'll uh, say something about what I mean by that in a moment. Uh, Part of my argument is that uh, this has happened before, and that's what these dates refer to, really. Uh, I'll expand on that more in a moment, but I don't want you to think that I'm making the argument that this pattern has existed in the past and therefore we should expect to find it in the future. In fact, my process of intellectual analysis worked the other way around, I first identified about three or four years ago what I thought was this realignment process going on, and then when I did a bit of like historical digging, I thought, well, wait a minute, I can see how this has happened before. Now, although I'm going to talk mostly about Britain, uh, the phenomenon I'm describing is in fact an international one, uh, and is most clearly uh, definable and most advanced in certain other parts of the world, notably in parts of Eastern Europe, uh, but elsewhere as well, including, for example, the, the United States. Now. What is the kind of background to this argument I'm making? Well, the background, I suppose, is that what you've got at the moment on both the conventionally defined left and right of politics, and more about what those terms actually mean in the moment, is a state of intellectual and political chaos. Uh, What I mean by that is that it's becoming increasingly difficult in many countries to define what it is to be on the conventionally understood left or right. Uh, There are all kinds of issues now uh, occupying a significant place in the political argument which cut across the uh, divisions and political uh, divides that we've become used to over the last 40 to 50 years. To put it another way, all kinds of strange or apparently strange alliances are being formed. Uh, But when you look at these in more detail, what you perceive is that, in fact, these are not random, that there is, in fact, a pattern which underlies them. I'm not the first person to make this observation. Uh, It was first made a few years ago by a friend of mine, Virginia Postrel. Uh, She picked up one particular aspect of it, but, in fact, it it has others. So what are some of the examples of these political alliances I'm talking about? Well, for example, there's the growing um, alliance over moves to restrict immigration and migration of people across geopolitical borders between people on the left, uh, people such as uh, Philip Goodhart, the recent party editor of Prospect magazine here, uh, and people on the traditional conservative right uh, of the, say, Pat Buchanan stripe in the United States. Uh, On the other hand, this is part of a more general phenomenon in which you get an increasing uh, process of alliance between that kind of right-wing person and a certain kind of uh, left-wing activist uh, in opposition to globalization, in opposition to the growth of large corporations, multinational corporations and the like. Uh, A more local issue which we can see uh, occurring in this country is the strange alliance between, on the one hand, people like Roger Scruton and, on the other hand, a certain kind of far-left protester in opposition to institutions like Tesco, uh, which, of course, was the subject of a recent uh, outburst of uh, allegedly popular opposition. Uh, which provoked one of Julie Birchall's good columns. I find she only has two kinds of standards as a journalist, absolutely brilliant or absolutely dire. Uh, This was one of her brilliant columns, I thought, really effective. Now, these kind of alliances mean that it's increasingly, you know, as I say, difficult to make sense of where people are coming from. And you've got, in addition to this, intellectual phenomena, such as here in the UK, the emergence, first of all, of the so-called red Toryism of Philip Blonde and other people such as Jesse Norman. Uh, And then on the other side of the fence, the so-called phenomenon of blue labour, as advocated by Maurice Glassman uh, and a number of other figures such as John Crudus, uh, which has apparently got considerable sort of like influence uh, at the highest levels of the Labour Party, at least if that's what Ed Miliband is. Uh, 
Uh, I have my doubts about that myself, but there you go. Um, and for reasons I'll go into in a moment, I think that in fact this is not going to be one of those kind of intellectual fads, which I think red Toryism is going to be, but something will actually probably have more uh, significant long-term uh, impact. Now, as I say, I, I, my argument is that we're in, entering in Britain, and not just in Britain, but more generally, an age of political realignment. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, in other words, what does realignment actually mean? Well, that's where this list of dates comes in. And as I say, this actually comes from a slightly different lecture. These are, if you like, the kind of political epochs that we've gone through since the emergence of organised party politics, at least at the parliamentary level, uh, around the time of the exclusion crisis in 1671. In each of these periods, you find that there's a recognisable political division within either the political class or, <coughs> latterly, within British society at large. This division is partly an ideological one, typically, but it's also partly a reflection of underlying divisions between powerful class interests. And you could be very you know, cynical, perhaps, and say that, to a great degree, the ideological divisions are simply rationalisations of the clash of class interests, if you wanted to take a kind of... Uh, sub Marxist approach to this. Uh, <coughs> something that I think actually has a lot going for it. Um, also, within each of these periods, there are a certain number of basic issues, if you like, which define the political debate at the time. So the basic periods are 1671 to 1723, which is from, as I say, the exclusion crisis when the Whig and Tory parties first appear in Parliament uh, to the kind of settling down of the new divisions in Parliament after Walpole's successful gaining of power in 1715 uh, and Bolingbroke's return from exile in France to basically head up from outside Parliament the newly emerged opposition to Walpole. Uh, then you've got the next period, which is the period of ten, basically the Whig supremacy from 1723 to the end of the Seven Years' War with the Peace of Paris in 1763. Uh, by the end of that war, the divisions which had defined this early, both this early period and this period have come to an end. Uh, the division between Whigs and Tories basically no longer exists, and the big issue that had divided them, uh, which was essentially that of which royal family should be uh, in charge of the crown and its powers, was no longer a pressing or living issue. Uh, other issues, such as particularly the question of what Britain's relations to France should be, uh, was no longer a divisive issue, which should have been particular in this first stage. Then you've got another period from 1763 to 1805, roughly from the Peace of Paris to the Treaty of Amiens. Uh, the feature of this period is that at the start of it, uh, there is no party division in uh, the political nation as reflected in Parliament. Instead, you have the kind of politics described by Sir Lewis Namia, which is one of lo lots of loose, small factions with no real um, ideological content at all. They're based entirely on clientage. But gradually, particularly after 1783, you get the emergence of a new party division. And this then becomes consolidated after a large faction of the, um, by now, extremely amorphous, supposedly called Whig Party, uh, headed by the Duke of Portland, goes over to the other faction that's begun to grow up around William Pitt the Younger. And so by 1763 to 1805, you're back to a uh, renewed division between two parties, which now have the old names again of Whig and Tory. The division now, though, is quite different from what has been this early period. The division now is over, essentially, um, the question of the Constitution and what, so whether or not there should be radical reform to the Constitution, and also whether or not there should be a move away from a particular style of economic management in the economy towards a more laissez-faire one. Next period, 1805 to 1847, uh, is the period that's commonly called the triumph of reform. It's the period in which the uh, argument is essentially over the two issues I just mentioned, and it culminates in the uh, repeal of the Corn Laws, the uh, definitive move to a policy of free trade and away from mercantilism, uh, and also radical reform of the institutions of the British states of the government uh, with reform of Parliament, but perhaps more significantly of local government. Then you've got the next period, 1847 to uh, 1893, uh, the defining date at the end there being the definitive split in the old Liberal Party over Irish Home Rule and the emergence of a different division, uh, and also a significant shift in class uh, allegiance in which a large part of the business class, which had previously solidly supported the Liberal Party, moves over to the Unionists, as the Conservatives now are called. Then 1893 to 1931, uh, the story of that kind of period is essentially that of the gradual and drawn-out death of uh, Victorian liberalism and the emergence of organised labour uh, to replace it as the major party in opposition to the Conservatives. You then get the very long period from 1931 to 1977, uh, which is the period when the division in politics is essentially between organised labour on the one hand uh, and uh, you know, the forces of in the investment class, if you will, on the other. 
uh, and the politics is essentially about whether or not you favour free market economics or some version, to a greater or lesser degree, of a planned economy. Uh, that then comes to an end. You enter into the period that we're still living in, but which I argue is now drawing to its close, uh, in which the division has been, well, what? Well, I'll say more about that in a moment. Now, the, the thing about each of these periods, as I said, is that what you find is that there are issues in this, often very intensely fought issues, but then typically towards the end, the last sort of decade of each of these periods, what had previously been enormously divisive and important issues suddenly just lose their salience entirely. Nobody bothers about them anymore. So things like, for example, the disestablishment of the English church, which is a huge issue up to uh, 18, 1893, um, is a minor issue in the period after that and completely vanishes during the 1920s, the realignment decade at the end of the uh, 1893-1931 period. Similarly, the argument about free trade, which is a huge argument in uh, these periods here, is not a serious question of political argument at all in the two latter stages. You also typically find that in the last decade of this, there's a major reshuffling of party allegiances and loyalties. So you get significant party splits, party realignments. Uh, so, for example, um, in this period, at the end of this period, the start of this period, the old Tory party splits, uh, and the moderate Tories join up with the court Whigs, uh, and you then get the formation of a new opposition made up of radical Whigs, uh, disaffected Whigs, and on the other hand, uh, the remnants of the Tory party now quite clearly Jacobites in their allegiance. Similarly, in this period here, the Liberal Unionists under Joseph Chamberlain believe the Liberal Party joined with the Conservatives to form the new Unionist coalition. Uh, similarly, you get a major realignment in the 1920s with the collapse of the old Liberal Party uh, and the emergence of the Labour Party and lots of people going in all sorts of directions during that decade, including in more than one direction in the organs of Churchill. Um, and so, what are we talking about here? Well, what has been going on here? Well, let's step back a bit for a moment and talk about what I think the wider context is, because I did say that while this is, if you like, the story of British political history, um, the, the realignment that I think we're seeing, or about to see in British politics, is in fact merely the local expression of a wider realignment. Now, in order to understand what that is, uh, I need to say something about this chart here. This, this may be familiar to many of you. This is the famous Nolan chart, uh, developed in the United States um, by David Nolan, uh, who may be known to some of you. Um, and it basically argues, the basis for this thinking is that the conventional one-dimensional division between left and right is inadequate for understanding the real divisions that we have in politics. And the argument is that there are two main variables. One is social liberalism versus social authoritarianism, which is this axis here. So if you're up at this end, then you're very socially liberal. Uh, you'd think that basically people should be allowed to do whatever they like in their, you know, most of their lives unless they, uh, you know, they harm somebody else directly and deliberately in the doing of it and maybe uh, you know, not even under certain circumstances. If you're at this end, then you think that the public authority or the collective has a right to regulate all sorts of details of the private lives of the members of the political society. So that's the split, if you like, between libertarianism and authoritarianism. This axis here is to do with economic policy. It's to do with whether or not you think that the uh, collective agency, the state, should have a large say in the running of economic affairs and life. Now, that produces a four-way box with four different combinations. Uh, in this box here, you have people who are, if you like, like most social democrats, they are essentially in favour of a fairly significant degree of state intervention in the economy, they're in favour of state redistribution of income, for example, but on the other hand, they're socially liberal. Uh, conversely, down here, you have people who are in favour of free markets, but are social conservatives and authoritarians to a greater or lesser degree. And then you have the two more like consistent positions on the, this one here, the consistent libertarians who favour uh, minimal government action in either sphere of life. And on the other hand down here you have the uh, consistent authoritarians uh, or consistent collectivists, if you will, who think that there should be collective regulation of both economic life uh, and cultural and personal life. Now, <clears throat> if you go back to the British situation here, during the period from 1931 to 1977, roughly, the split was really between these two quadrants here. Uh, the Labour Party, generally speaking, in that period, favoured economic intervention in the economy, favoured a planned economy to quite a remarkable degree, uh, but was also, and this is something that's commonly forgotten, very socially and culturally conservative. Uh, in fact, most of the kind of Labour Party fit leading figures in the 1950s, 1940s, uh, 19, through much of the early 1960s, were actually, in many ways, more politically and culturally conservative to small c than their counterparts in the Conservative Party. Uh, there were as many Labour MPs, for example, who would vote against uh, moves to repeal the death penalty 
uh, or who were opposed to significant relaxation of, you know, of any kind of control of immigration as they were in the Conservative Party. Uh, the Conservative Party, meanwhile, was actually sleeping really this way. It was slightly more in favour of the Barclays economy than the Labour Party, uh, but it was also at that point very much a traditionally socially conservative party which sought to uphold an established order. Now, during the 1960s and 70s, two things happened as part of the ideological realignment that took part of, in that uh, sort of era, uh, which introduced the period we now have. The first is that the left, beginning with uh, the reforms that Roy Jenkins brought in during the 1960s, became increasingly socially liberal. So the centre of gravity of the political left moved up into this quadrant here, if you will. Uh, meanwhile, the Conservative Party uh, became much more clearly defined in this quadrant, uh, and it became much more clearly economically uh, free market than it had been before. So it moved, if you like, from there to there. So for the last uh, 30, 40 years, the real kind of division that has dominated politics has been between this quadrant and this quadrant. And this is not only true in the British context, it's also true, say, in the United States, it's true in uh, most other countries. The only major exception really is France, which uh, still has the kind of politics that we had in the uh, earlier part of the 20th century between these two parts here. Uh, and in fact, actually, within this one quadrant here, uh, the authoritarian quadrant. Now, what is happening in many countries of the world now is that quite clearly, I think, there's a move whereby the division is increasingly not between a party that combines economic interventionism with social liberalism versus a party that combines free markets with cultural conservatism, but increasingly it's between these two more consistent quadrants. The realignment that's taking place in many countries is that increasingly politics is no longer that one, it's rather defined between, on the one hand, a party which is broadly free market to a greater or lesser degree, but also socially liberal, not particularly interested in conserving traditions, uh, generally speaking rather internationalist and not very keen on nationalism, and on the other side, a party that is nationalist, uh, collectivist, uh, very much oriented towards a welfare state and state intervention in the economy, but typically on a national basis, not, not an international basis, uh, which is also typically very culturally uh, conservative and traditionalist. The country where this division has in fact first emerged most clearly is Poland, uh, where in the last couple of elections the former communists who were essentially um, in, in this quadrant here collapsed uh, and you now have a division between the party of the Kaczynski twins uh, which is very much located in this bottom quadrant here uh, and the party that's currently in power in Poland, Mr Tusk's party which is very much up in that quadrant. Uh, similar divisions taking place also uh, in a rather complicated way in Hungary where at the moment there's basically just one party that has almost all the seats in the Hungarian parliament, but which is increasingly showing internal divisions splitting into a party basically in each of these quadrants here. And again, what has happened is that this quadrant here has virtually emptied. It's, it's no longer got a suitable political position. The same thing is happening in the United States, uh, I would argue. Uh, one of the most interesting and revealing things that's been going on in the politics of the right in the United States in the last four or five years uh, is the kind of basic breakdown of the marriage of convenience between libertarians and conservatives that took place during the 1960s and earlier. Uh, what essentially happened was that during the 1950s a kind of coalition was formed uh, from people from this quadrant, consistent libertarians, uh, and people from down here, people, you know, the kind of mainstream American conservatives who combine social conservatism uh, with uh, free market economics. That marriage is now broken down quite spectacularly uh, and there are all kinds of recurring uh, bust-ups taking place. Now, uh, uh, when Barack Obama got elected, it looked for a while as though the warring parties to that unhappy marriage were going to make it up, uh, because they faced, it seemed, a common foe, uh, somebody who was interested in expanding the role of the state and the economy significantly. Uh, however, for various reasons, uh, that um, patched makeup was temporary. And what's happened in various things recently, such as the CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Committee Conference, uh, both last year and this year, has been uh, quite spectacular rows between uh, the Conservatives and the Libertarians. Uh, and this looks set to continue in the Republican primary season in the run-up to the general election next year. Uh, as anyone who saw or watched bits of the recent debate in North Carolina will be able to tell you. Similarly, um, the certain things are going on on the, the left, and the same thing also is happening here, in my view. Uh, one of the um, things that uh, has happened with the recent formation of the recent coalition uh, is that it's become obvious that there are people, politicians in uh, particularly the Liberal Democrat and Conservative parties who uh, basically belong in that quadrant here, uh, 
uh, and that they are increasingly at odds over many issues with the people down in this quadrant here. Uh, at the moment, that's been blurred because of the events of the past week, but I predict it's actually going to re-emerge uh, given the you know, basic discontent that a certain kind of conservative increasingly feels with uh, the drift of policy and all of the various something I return to. Now, that basically is the kind of thesis I'm arguing. Now, why? what is driving this? What is the thing that is making this happen? Uh, more generally, universally, um, I think it's a function of a number of things. One of them is the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, because it was the perceived and actual military and ideological threat from the Soviet Union that more than anything else lay behind the alliance between these two quadrants here. In other words, it was that which really uh, was the, provided the impetus for uh, the alliance, the pooling of political efforts uh, and energy between libertarians uh, and free market conservatives. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union and the clear disappearance of the threat of communism as a kind of viable alternative to uh, Western capitalist democracy, the reason, the basic force behind that alliance has been removed. And as a result, uh, other kind of divisions uh, have re-emerged. The second thing which lies behind this shift at a global level uh, is the process, very well, misnamed process, of globalization. I um, have another whole lecture on that, but essentially... Uh, it's a mistake to think that the globalisation that's taken place since the mid-1980s is anything particularly new. As a number of people have pointed out, many people in fact, virtually anyone with any historical knowledge, it's simply an episode in a much longer process that's been going on for a very, very long time. However, what you can't deny is that the episode of increased economic integration across national borders, which is what we mean by this, that took place between roughly 18, 1985, 86, uh, and now, uh, is the most dramatic and intense such process since the latter part of the 19th century, since the Belle Epoque. Uh, what that has done is to bring to light a number of tensions which again are increasingly driving uh, libertarians and uh, free market conservatives apart. Above all, questions to do with the free movement of labour internationally uh, and the free movement of uh, all kinds of goods and services across borders. In other words, the degree to which uh, the process of globalisation undermines the nation state uh, and settled and established political communities and orders, which of course, if you're a conservative, is part of central part of your ideology to try to sustain uh, and protect. Similarly, on the other hand, the left um, globally has undergone a kind of crisis of confidence because uh, increasingly, well, the, the kind of common belief on the uh, mainstream left, not just the Marxist left, until the 1980s was that basically they were the wave of the future and that the way in which modernity was going to develop was in the direction of a more or less socialist society. That became very obvious in the uh, 1980s and 90s. This was not the case, that in fact history was not working out the way it was supposed to. Now, faced with this, um, what has happened is that uh, the left, uh, largely in many countries, has given up on modernity. Uh, and what it is increasingly doing is adopting a very markedly conservative posture and stance. Uh, and, for example, it's a very small, little confirmatory instance of this, uh, there was an article in The Guardian uh, recently on their comment is free page uh, arguing that the real division in the modern world is now between, uh, and one was a kind of list of conventional left-wing parties, but then the end of it came the term respect for tradition. And the idea is nostal that nostalgia uh, and respect for tradition, opposition to the way in which markets undermine traditional and such ways of life, <coughs> is now a feature of left-wing politics, uh, whereas support for innovation, uh, novelty, uh, and uh, the kind of technological new uh, is a feature instead of the political right. This was the point that uh, the person I mentioned, Virginia Postrel, uh, made some 12, 13 years ago now, uh, when she said that the real division increasingly was between what she calls dynamists, people who welcome innovation, novelty, the new, uh, and stasists, people who fear change, who don't like the way the world is changing and want to either push change back uh, or at least hold the line against it, and that this was a new division that cut across the conventional left and right. So those are like the global factors. Uh, if you want to think of it in sort of blunt terms, what you've got is a series of issues that are basically pushing conservatives down in this position to either become more consistent and libertarian, or else give up their economic liberalism and join hands with certain factions of the left in a more uh, coherently uh, authoritarian position. Roger Scruton, for example, is one of the people who's moved quite clearly in that direction. Uh, because uh, whereas in the 1980s he was he was not he was never very interested in economics, quite frankly. But whereas in those days he would generally support 
broadly free market position. Uh, in recent years, he's become quite explicitly and overtly hostile to that. Uh, on the very sensible grounds, from his own particular perspective, uh, that the free market is very corrosive of traditions and settled and established ways of life. Conversely, another lot of conservatives are basically making the decision, this is very noticeable in the United States, that if push comes to shove, they'll pick tax cuts over stopping gay marriage, you know, putting it in crude terms. Uh, basically, what they've decided is that economic liberalism and tax cuts matters more to them uh, than cultural conservatism. Uh, and so they're basically moving out of this quadrant. Similarly, on the left, you find uh, over the, the crucial, one of the big dividing issues is immigration. Uh, an increasingly large number of people on the left are arguing that you can't really have a functioning social democracy and have the kind of uh, free movement of labour, free movement of people around the world uh, that the left has supported for the last 30, 40 years or so. Uh, and so they're moving out of this quadrant down into here. Conversely, some of the others are deciding that basically they like globalisation, they think it's a good thing, uh, and that they're moving more clearly into a coherent, consistently, or more broadly unitarian position. Obviously, these are fuzzy groups. I'm not just saying everyone's becoming a hardcore purist. What I'm talking about is kind of general uh, shift of the centre of gravity. Now, what's happening in the British context in particular uh, is divisions within both the Conservative and Labour parties over essentially what to do and how to uh, respond to the situation they find themselves in at the moment uh, and the kind of different shifts in the pattern of public opinion as expressed not just through elections but through other things as well. Now, what I... What I um, I think is going to happen as a result. There are two. There could have been two possible ways, courses that this realignment I'm speaking about could have taken. One, had there been electoral reform, would have been a quite marked shuffling of the parties, a breakdown of the two major parties, and the emergence of a much more fluid multi-party system, maybe on a temporary basis until a new alignment emerged. I think that that is now not going to happen. What I think instead is going to happen is that we are going to end up still with a broadly two-party system, uh, unless we do indeed have some uh, kind of dramatic constitutional change in the next 10 years. But it will now increasingly be, as I say, between a party which is broadly in that quadrant and a party that's broadly in that quadrant. The question is which will go where. Um, I, my own prediction, I think it's pretty clear why I think this, is the Conservative Party is going to end up in this quadrant here, the kind of broadly free market, socially liberal sector, uh, and the Labour Party is going to end up in the much more culturally conservative, consistently authoritarian position. Uh, so I think that what we're going to see in Labour Party politics over the next 10 years uh, is a very dramatic move towards uh, much more explicit cultural and social conservatism. Uh, and also, on the one hand, a shift to the left on economics, but a shift to the, if you want to call it in that kind of language, the right, uh, on a whole range of other issues. Uh, this will severely piss off uh, their friends in Hampstead and The Guardian. Uh, but I think that, in fact, it's almost bound to happen, not least because of the outcome of last week. Um, one, one of my, my own take on the outcome of the AV referendum is that the most important aspect of it is that it was an enormous crushing victory for the working class small c conservative element in the Labour Party uh, and an equally devastating defeat for the middle class uh, Guardian reading small l liberal wing of the party. Uh, and one of the factors behind this is that the um, Labour Party leadership, at least the more intelligent people amongst them, quite apart from uh, genuine conviction and sympathy, are also increasingly alarmed by the, the perception that they're losing the white working class vote. Uh, and the perception is that they're losing it because of their uh, interest in or identification with a kind of agenda of cultural liberalism, uh, guardian liberalism, if you will, uh, which alienates their core working class support. Uh, plus, also, I think there is an increasing feeling, actually, amongst the you know, more thinking people on the left, people like John Crudders, who I mentioned a moment ago, that if you do favour a broadly social democratic kind of society, one with an active interventionist role for government uh, in economic affairs and other things, then this can't really work if you try to combine it with cultural individualism. Uh, there's a kind of inherent discordance or incompatibility, it's increasingly felt, I think, uh, between a programme of cultural individualism, which emphasises self-realisation as the primary goal of life, uh, and a programme of economic collectivism, which emphasises subordinating uh, your own goals to the common good as being the main feature of sensible politics. Conversely, on the Conservative side, I think that uh, it, it's, it's very clear that the kind of Conservative agenda that someone like, say, Peter Hitchens uh, wants to see followed uh, is uh, you know not uh, the way the party needs to go because of the political situation it faces. Uh, adopting that will not gain it votes and will lose it votes in the crucial area it needs. Plus, increasingly, uh, <coughs> it's dominated by 
uh, a particular uh, kind of social formation which uh, doesn't accept this. Now, what about, what about the, I did say that I do think you can explain these kind of epochs in British political history, which are quite clearly generational, by the way. That's something that quite you can quite clearly see, I think, from the kind of the fact that these are almost all 30 to 50 year blocks, basically. There's clearly a generational shift involved in all of this. Um, what the, one of the other things I say, though, is that, that these kind of eras tend to be uh, partly produced by uh, particular divisions of class interest, if you will. And I mentioned that during the period from 1931 to 1977, or indeed even perhaps before then, the real division in British politics and their and more widely British societies between organised labour on the one hand uh, and uh, we've quite called the investment class, the business class on the other, um, with other social groups like the aristocracy, which had been obviously a dominant social force up to about the 1890s, really, really just relegated to the um, sort of status of pantomime dames, essentially. Um, for the last 30 or 40 years, the real division in terms of class interests has been between two groups which were marginal until the 60s, but which then became much more powerful and important thereafter. On the one side, there's the financial services sector and the what you might call in loose terms, the city. Uh, which was, you know, we tend to think, oh, it's always been the case that the city has had a dominant influence in British economic policy, and particularly in the Conservative Party. Well, no, that is not the case at all. Um, if you go back to the 1950s, 1940s, 1960s, what is striking is how little influence the city had on political policy making and things of that sort. Uh, but during the 70s and early 80s, there was a decisive shift uh, of power within uh, British society away from um, the more old-fashioned industrial sector to the uh, financial sector, uh, and they became one of the two major sort of power blocks in British society. The other class that has been uh, dominant in politics up till now, uh, for the last 40 years anyway, is what you might call the media and creative class, uh, which is um, a, a particular social formation, which again, in some sense, had always existed, but which had not had any particular economic or political significance until... Uh, the kind of cultural revolutions of the 1960s and 1970s. The reason why that matters is because of two things which are often overlooked. One of them is the economic importance of that sector. Uh, people often don't realise, but pop music is actually the second largest contributor to GDP, the British GDP, after finance. Um, it's one of our biggest industries. Uh, cultural industries generally are hugely more important in Britain now uh, than uh, traditional manufacturing, agriculture, uh, trade, or a whole lot of other traditional sectors. Uh, and their importance in terms of their contribution to GDP and the number of people they employ has been growing consistently since the 1960s. The other thing is that uh, during this period, one of the dominant features of this period, uh, the one we're still living in, is the domination of public discourse and argument by mass electronic media, above all by television, to a lesser, lesser degree by radio. Uh, and that means that, therefore, if you like, the class that essentially staffs the mass media uh, has had an enormous and disproportionate influence on political discourse, uh, and its own particular worldview and perspective has tended to be culturally dominant, uh, something which leads the people who belong to that social formation to enormously overestimate the degree to which their own way of thinking about the world is, in fact, that of the majority of people in, in the UK, which it clearly isn't, which is why they're so painfully surprised when... Um, uh, it, they, they find that it ain't, as they have done this last week. Um, and also, it's, it's also why you know, they can't understand why Simon Cowell and Jeremy Clarkson are popular and uh, you know, pull their hair out of the sort of like success of people and so on. But the point is that those are the two powerful groups. And essentially, in many ways, you could, you know, you could say that the uh, ideological division I outlined uh, earlier is actually the reflection of those two particular class interests. Now, both of those, it seems to me, are currently about to enter a period of severe decline or recession. Um, I think that the importance of financial services in the British economy and society more generally is going to undergo a sharp decline in the next 10 years. Uh, not so much because of any policy that the British government is following, or even because of the financial crisis, but rather because of, I think, an almost inevitable shift of the, a large part of that uh, economic activity away from Europe to the Far East. Um, I would pretty much say it's a racing certainty that a very large number of our major financial institutions and even more importantly, the support firms that actually provide most of the employment in large parts of the southeast are going to leave and go to uh, Singapore, probably, Hong Kong, Shanghai, uh, maybe Dubai, if that part of the world stays reasonably stable. Uh, and so I think that regardless almost of what government policy may be, uh, the importance and weight of uh, that sector in the British economy is going to decline. Now, what will replace it? Who knows? I don't claim to know that at all. Um, and anyone who thinks they do is an idiot.
Uh, but I think you can say that part of it is very likely to decline. Uh, the other thing is that the, the importance of the other social formation I mentioned is actually in decline as well. The main reason being here, the decline in the impact and importance of television in public discourse and argument. Um, I don't know if you know, but income from television advertisements peaked in about 1994 in the UK, uh, the early 90s in the United States, and it's been in steady decline ever since. Uh, that is why all the formerly prosperous and independent television, com independent television companies were merged into just one big uh, loss-making ITV. Uh, and the, the decline in television advertising shows no sign of letting up. Um, the reason being that it's extremely expensive, and the advertisers have cottoned on to the fact that the great, a greater part of television advertising is completely ineffectual. Um, it's extraordinary. I mean, advertising professionals will tell you that at least one-third of all... Uh, television advertising has absolutely no measurable effect whatever. Oh, no, it, it, Not all, it all annoys. Completely annoys. And another 20% actually has a negative effect. It makes people less likely to buy the product. Um, now, you know, Lord Leverhulme, the man who virtually invented modern mass marketing in Britain, went, you know, for sunlight soap, did famously once say that uh, he knew perfectly well that 50% of the money he spent on advertising uh, was completely wasted. The problem was he didn't know which half it was. Um, uh, but increasingly, people do know that television advertising is a waste of time, really, uh, except in certain very specific circumstances. Uh, it's actually much better to advertise on radio. Um, radio is by far the most effective advertising medium. It's one of the reasons why commercial radio, in contrast to commercial television, is enjoying a kind of golden age right now. But of course, with the internet and things of that sort, this is happening. What this means is that the media class, if you will, uh, is in the process of what rapid decline and its ability to shape public argument is diminishing uh, and all kinds of other voices coming to the fore. So I won't predict how this will actually work out, but what I do think is uh, that we are going through these, one of these realignments and what has happened in the past, as, just as has happened in the past, I think that certain kinds of issues that we now think of as absolutely definitive and hugely important are going to just vanish off the map and nobody is going to give them the proverbial monkeys about them anymore and we will sort of scratch our heads in about 15 years' time and wonder what we are getting so excited about. Uh, conversely, new issues will appear uh, and I think that in fact also there will be a quite significant realignment which will show, show itself in, for example, quite different distributions of support, uh, popular support and uh, allegiance. It probably won't take the shape of a major party realignment as it did in some of these past, but not all of these past uh, realignments mainly because I think of the extreme robustness of the two major parties, and also because, as I say, uh, it's very clear now that there isn't going to be, a, and barring some kind of major crisis, rather, a significant change in the voting system, uh, which would be a necessary condition, I think, for um, a major kind of realignment of parties taking the form of new formations taking place. I will say, by the way, one thing, um, just to sort of, like, uh, conclude this. Um, if you think about what British the British electorate looks like at the moment, uh, I'd say that there are the following number of groups, basically. Uh, this, is rather, this is rather sort of downbeat end talk, I'm afraid, from our point of view anyway. Um, you've got a number of um, groups, if you like, which you can identify. One is what you might call traditionalist Burkean conservatives, um, who have almost no political representation at all now. There's very few of them left even in the Conservative Party. But I would say, if you look at opinion polls and you know, these kind of... Uh, samples you can do. They have about 10% of the electorate who would broadly fit to that category. Then there is a group of about 15% who are, I suppose you call them Thatcherites. They're people who combine, uh, who are from this, very much this quadrant here, who combine uh, free market, uh, strong support for free markets with cultural conservatism, strong nationalism and the like. Then you've got another group, which is essentially Orange Book, Lib Dems, Lib Dems, plus certain conservatives, and even the old individual, crazy individual in the Labour Party, Chisler Stewart and so on. Uh, we're very much in this, bit, this block here. Uh, then you've got a block of people who are social liberals, who are in here, um, and social democrats, uh, who are sort of more on that border there. There's a few radicals who are um, a much smaller number than they think, who are increasingly in that area. And then there's the largest single block, and the largest single block is people who basically are sort of in the middle of the partly in that quadrant, in other words, people who generally combine um, a support for a fairly interventionist kind of economy with support also for kind of rather nostalgic conservatism uh, and also strong support for nationalism. Uh, and uh, the, if you, any of you, how many people here listen to Alex Salmon's victory speech after his stunning victory, which I thought, by the way, was the most significant thing? Well, you should try and see if you can get a clip of it on YouTube and listen to it, because first of all, it was an absolutely masterful speech. I mean, there's no doubt he's the most effective politician 
of our time right now. Uh, and that was an absolutely exemplary example of how to uh, do that particular kind of thing. But also what was interesting was the whole line he took, and it sounded very much like a kind of one-nation conservatism that he was putting forward. Uh, and it was all about, essentially, the idea of Scotland as a collective national project. Uh, now, personally, that kind of politics makes me want to throw up, uh, but it's extremely popular, I have to say. And so my rather grim conclusion, I'm afraid, is that we're going to end up with um, the split being between these two areas. So we will have a more consistently liberal party here versus more consistently authoritarian party here. But at the moment, uh, the consistently authoritarian side has the balance of, the, of advantage in terms of popular support, quite definitely, I would say. What we really hope uh, is that, you know, Ed Miliband remains leader of the Labour Party for quite a while. Um, and that there is no sort of a court of Alex Salmond emerges down here in England, because that would be a real disaster in my view. Uh, but that basically, that's my kind of story. And as I say, what I've taught, tried to do is say that what we've got here is a change going on in the UK, which I think, however, is also part of a much wider change in the way in which uh, politics is uh, being conducted in most representative democracies in the moment. But we're quite wrong. Stop and mm -hmm. in the middle. Yeah. Any questions, Bob? You, you, you almost answered my question towards the end, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, is there a chance then that the Labour Party might eventually play the Nationalist card? I think they're going to do it very soon. Mm. Uh, and not just, I don't think any might about it, I think they're going to. I mean, leaving Europe and all that, or at least oh, in terms of that, I, I think Europe is one of the issues that's going to um, be, you know, fall off the edge of the cliff, and in five years, no, everyone will wonder what the hell we were getting excited about. Well, one way or the other. Though. One way or the other. <laughs> my own guess is that it actually, there's my own sort of increasingly confident feeling is that there's going to be a kind of amicable divorce. Basically, um, we will be asked to leave. Now, what I mean is this: I think that it, it's very clear if you look at the headlines at the moment that the crisis in the euro zone is getting worse. Mm. Um, I mean, they had this ridiculous pantomime situation where they had a top-secret meeting of all these Euro finance ministers in Luxembourg. And first of all, they deny that there's any meeting taking place. Uh, then when they uh, say, well, oh, yes, maybe there is a meeting taking place, but we're not talking under even mentioning default. Then it turns out they have been talking about default. Of course they bloody have. They'd be irresponsible. They weren't. Um, but the point is that it's become increasing. If you look at the um, yields on Irish, Greek, Portuguese... Spanish debt, they've been going up steadily. The whole point about uh, these bailouts was meant to be to make it safe to lend to these countries. The fact the yields have gone up shows that the people who are lending to these countries, in fact, do not regard it as being safe. Now, what this shows is that you basically cannot have what, what virtually every economist across the political spectrum said when the euro was set up, which is that you can't have a monetary union without an effective political union, and particularly not without both free movement of labour within the currency area which is difficult in Europe for obvious cultural and other reasons, and some government which can use the taxation and spending power to redistribute income from one part of the union to another. Now, what I think that means is that there's going to be a kind of existential choice which will face the European leaders either towards the end of this year or more like the spring of next year. And that will be to either effectively create a real European government with real power or to let the euro collapse effectively, break up into several different bits. Um, and it, at the moment, I'm not quite clear which of these will be, but I think there's so much capital invested in the European project, and the commitment of the European political classes to it is so great that they'll actually bite the bullet and try and do the first one. And I think at that point, several countries will either leave or be asked to leave. I think the Greeks are going to be asked to leave. Um, uh, I think you know, the Germans bitterly regret that they ever let them into the EU. Um, and I think that uh, it could well be the case that Britain and Ireland will be Either I see, or I think more likely they'll just basically bugger off, you know. Because I think, given that kind of choice, the bulk of the Labour Party would also just simply not be prepared to go, you know, agree to that that kind of significant surrender of uh, sovereign power. Particularly not if it meant things like giving up fiscal power and so on. Uh, and uh, quite apart from the fact that, as I say, one of the things about the Labour Party at the moment is that quite apart from their genuine principled beliefs, and I think you know a lot of Labour politicians just wouldn't tolerate that on principle grounds, uh, they are scared witless of the prospect of losing working class seats to some kind of right-wing populist party. The nightmare they have is that in Britain we'll see the emergence of a party like 
the Danish People's Party or the uh, Austrian Freedom Party or the uh, Flans Bloc, which will take a large number of working class votes on a nationalist populist agenda. Uh, and this is the, the kind of thing that gives them, you know, gets them wetting the bed. Uh, and they're going to do an awful lot to try and head that off. Uh, and I, I, so I think, in fact, that Europe is not going to be an issue in five years' time. I think the Labour Party is going to become much more clearly nationalist than uh, it has been. Like I say, this is going to be one of a number of shifts that will seriously piss off their Guardian reading Hampstead um, supporters. But I think, you know, people like John Prescott and David Blunkett or John Reid are not going to lose a minute's sleep. Maybe even a second sleep over that. It will probably make them sleep all the sounder. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, well, as someone who did actually watch the uh, South Carolina, uh, yeah. probably, uh, just just on on the American side of things, I was just wondering what you thought. The I mean, on, on the one hand, it was nice to have heroin legalization getting a rounding applause in South Carolina, uh, but then. <laughs> You know, on the same stage, there were obviously the normal uh, social conservatives like Rick Santorum and these sort of people. And I'm yeah. just wondering, I mean, what, what you think is the future for American conservatism? Because even in the Tea Party movement, there is this split between the sort of sure, yeah. social conservatives and the sort of Ron Paul libertarians. It, it's, uh, if you had a proportional representation system in the United States, then very rapidly you become obvious that there, were two, there was a libertarian party that's a kind of popular social conservative party. As it is, of course, you've, there's a first pass the electoral system, so they have to try and cooperate. But it's just getting increasingly difficult, and I think that it, it is almost impossible to avoid major bust-ups. Uh, the problem, the kind of position of a lot of mainstream Republicans is that basically to count as a conservative, to be defined as a conservative, you have to have a, a kind of iron triangle of views. You have to be fiscally conservative, never mind what the Republicans have actually done when they're in office, that's another story. Um, you've got to be culturally conservative and you've got to be a hawk, foreign affairs. Um, people like Gary Johnson, Ron Paul, uh, you know, only agree with one of part of those that triad. They're opposed to the other two parts. Uh, and there's an increasingly large number of voters like them. If you look at uh, indicative market research, which a former colleague of mine at IHS has done, a chap called David Kirby, um, there's about 15% of the American electorate who have the broad combination of views, which is non-interventionist foreign policy, fiscal conservatism, social liberalism. Um, they define themselves, interestingly, not as libertarians, but as moderates. What that means is they see their views not as radical, but as common sense. And in particular, they think that the fiscal conservatism is just common sense. Uh, but they also think, well, we're not like these lunatic Christian right gay bashes in the Republican Party. So they think of themselves as moderate. The point is that those voters are crucial to winning federal elections because they tend to be disproportionately concentrated in crucial swing districts and swing states. So it doesn't matter if you win, you know, uh, Kansas or, um, you know, Wyoming by a landslide, or actually Wyoming's one of the states you probably wouldn't win by a landslide, because that's actually got a disproportionately large number of these people. But if you win, say, certain southern states by a landslide with a cultural populist conservative message, and you then lose states where there is a significant block of voters like that, so the difficulty for Republican politicians is that they have to try and keep both lots on board. Now, there's two sides of the story. One is the emergence of more consistently libertarian candidates. The other is the emergence of consistently authoritarian candidates, like the dreadful Mike Huckabee. Uh, I mean, you know, he is just so wrong. He's, he's hard to say. He's, there's nothing redeeming about the man. Um, and and he's, an ex he's an expression of an increasingly significant phenomenon on the American right, which is that the evangelical Christian right is becoming increasingly um, economically interventionist. Uh, and this is something that's been going on for several years now, but it's now becoming more and more apparent, uh, it seems to me. And in some ways, that should not surprise us. Um, if you look at the... In the past, people always wondered why it was that Reagan and the first Bush won landslide victories at the presidential level, but the Democrats still had a big rock-hard grip on the Congress, particularly the House. And if you looked at the districts, the House districts, the reason became very clear. There were one block of districts that the, voted Democrat both ways, consistently liberal in the American sense. There were another block that voted Republican in both elections, consistently conservative in the American sense. And then there was a big block of about 140 seats that voted Republican for president but Democrat for Congress. Those seats were overwhelmingly all bar a couple in the South. And what they represented was the preferences of a big block of voters who basically liked big government, the TVA and 
all that kind of stuff. But we're also very culturally conservative, so it made that voting pattern made perfect sense. There was also a smaller block of seats, overwhelmingly in the northeast and places like Iowa and the mountain states, which had the opposite split vote. Uh, about 40 districts which voted Democrat for president but Republican for Congress, and that's people who are socially liberal, so they want a Democratic president who is going to veto you know, um, the agenda of the Christian right, but they're in favour of lower taxes and less government spending, so they vote for Republicans in Congress. Now, what has happened in the last 10 years or so is that that, that first block of votes, they, they just those are the seats that switched when Newt Gingrich got control of the House back. Uh, but increasingly, the voters down there are reverting back to their earlier combinations. That's, you know, so I think that all kinds of things have liked to happen in American conservatism. Uh, and the, as I said right at the start, I think the, the divorce between um, libertarians and conservatives, which looked to be off um, a couple of years ago, is now very much back on the agenda. And there's things going on on the American left as well, a corresponding kind of divisions going on. They're just not apparent at the moment because the Democrats are in power. These things tend to happen when the party is out of out of power. But then, uh, Johnson and Paul always refer to themselves as the real Republicans, people that actually are actually. That's because they're running an internal internal party election. What is going on at the moment is an argument for who can get the Republican brand, basically, and capture it. And that, of course, because of the way the American political system works, and particularly because of all these outrageous laws that make it almost impossible to run a third party candidacy, it's very very important to capture the. The party for that kind of position. The equivalent split on the Democrat side is between the more progressive wing of the party, who are now hugely dis, dis, disappointed and disgusted with Barack Obama because he thought, they thought he was their man and they found out he's not. And on the other side, the kind of Bill Clinton wing of the party. Um, and that's the kind of corresponding battle that's going on in that side of the fence. So you know, it'll, it'll continue on both sides. Yeah. So it's a very young demographic. I mean, ironically, Ron Paul's not a young guy. He's one yeah. of the oldest candidates, but a very young demographic has come through. In the last election, he, were, he raised something like $6 million online in one day for yeah. his campaign. Uh, and now, I mean, he was sort of cut out traditionally by Fox News and all this. Like, traditional right media don't like right. Ron Paul, particularly. He's not a near. But uh, young people increasingly don't watch the news. They, they get their views from, yeah, yeah. from YouTube and social media and everything else. Exactly. That's part of the phenomenon I mentioned, the decline of television as a major force in political consciousness. We're in the early days of this yet, but it's, it's going on at a very accelerating rate. Um, and as you say, people use Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, all these other kind of social media to get their news, get their um, uh, opinions formed. And uh, part of one aspect of that is this. Sorry? They're also very suspicious. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and with good reason, if you see what way they go on in the, the US in particular, but also here. So the, one of the interesting things is the younger generation. I mean, the thing is, there are two sides to this. One is the emergence of you know, a much more consistent and radically libertarian position amongst younger people. But you have the other thing going on as well yeah, amongst the younger generations. Well, the emergence of a much more coherent, coherent and consistently anti-libertarian position, if you will. That hasn't happened so much in the United States yet, but it's definitely happening over here, I think. Well, that, that was my second question. If um, if the green bubble doesn't pop because the cost of taking greenism seriously starts bearing down on people and they say, no, 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 this is, this is silly, this will stop, you can see a kind of greenery becoming local sourcing, opting out of globalization, tying in with the nationalists. Absolutely, yes. that's my view. Very much so. And I think that the, the current kind of argument is going to be, oh, we're in the age of peak oil, uh, we need to relocalize, we need to downscale the economy, and this is linked with um, uh, the idea of the nation as the kind of shelter in the storm, and the idea also that what you need is a kind of more planned and organized economy with a lot more direct political intervention to you know, keep the nation afloat. Um, and that also means a radical restructure of the welfare state. What I think is going to happen on the political left is a significant move away from uh, the welfare the kind of welfare state we've had in the last 40 years and a reversion back to the kind of idea, in terms of advocacy anyway, uh, the kind of idea of the welfare state we had with the beverage report. Because uh, if you do, well, there's a, I recommend to you a very really good book called Welcome to Any Town by a fellow called Julian Bagini. Oh, um, a philosopher. So a philosopher, yeah, so called philosopher. He, he did a thing a few years ago where um, he discovered that the town of Maltby near Rotherham is apparently the most average town in the UK, in the sense that by all these kind of you know demographics 
measures, it's the closest to the national average, which makes me realise that lots of Britain must be in a really bad shape while being the average, I must say. But anyway, he went to live there for a year. Um, it was a kind of into darkest Yorkshire kind of thing. Um, and um, what, what, what he, the book, though, is actually very good because what, what, it, he, what he observed was the kind of ways of life of you know, the great mass of the British public and how different they were from you know, what people in his kind of class thought they, should, they were or should be. And one of the things he observed was that the great mass of the British public strongly supports the welfare state, but they have a very particular notion of what the welfare state should be, and that is that it should be contributory and based on national entitlement. In other words, it's a citizen good that you get by virtue of living in the UK and paying into it. Now, that's radically different from the philosophy that has dominated the British welfare state since the 70s, which is ethical universalism, where the idea is that you do not distinguish between long-time residents and uh, incomers, uh, and the basis on which welfare benefits are given out is one of universal human rights, above all, needs, defined in very universalistic terms. That is completely rejected by the uh, great mass of the British public, particularly the working class voters. But it has been throughout the 1950s. That was, that was how it was. I mean, that was the basis on which the state Yes, but I mean, 50s, 60s, 70s, there's never been a time when the vast, vast, vast majority of Labour supporters have supported the Guardian for the No, absolutely, not at all. But the point is that there was a major shift in welfare policy in the late 60s, early 70s, mm. um, through to the late 70s, and supported by both the major parties, interestingly. And that uh, it, you know, has, is one of the main reasons why working-class Labour voters are now so disaffected from their own party, because... Um, there was a recent report by Michael Young's organisation um, into housing in the east end of London, a place like Dagenham and so on. And one of the things they found was that the biggest cause of hostility towards ethnic minorities and incomers generally was housing policy because it was a very powerfully held belief that if you lived in an area for a long time, you had a, you should be top of the queue to get housing. Whereas, of course, housing is now allocated on the basis of need points, which are allocated on a completely neutral oh, it basis. Be, it be time alone. And, it, and, so access, and so basically somebody who has just arrived because they have children will get a house before, ahead of somebody who has lived there for a very long time, his parents have lived there. And that is intensely resented mm -hmm. and is one of the major driving forces behind you know, support for the BNP in places like um, Dagenham. Uh, so what I think the Labour Party is increasingly going to do, and this is what people like Maurice Glassman are definitely advocating it should do, is to move away from this universalistic notion of the welfare state towards a much more nationalist uh, version of the welfare state, which is much more in, in tune with what their core electorate want. And I suspect that, in fact, then, increasingly, you know, there's a kind of natural dynamic to these things. Uh, the, if you think, look at that kind of Nolan chart, the people whose ox is going to be gone and are going to be deeply unhappy uh, in the next few years are two separate groups. One is the kind of uh, the Roger Helmer people, if you like, the kind of more you know, traditionally conservative wing of the Conservative Party. The other is the Guardian reading left. They're both going to be extremely unhappy because each of them will think that their party, as they see it, is moving away from their political views, which they will be. Someone else got some support? Oh. Uh, financing the whole shebang, will that have a, an impact? Well, yes, I mean, that will be one of the major things. I mean, the, the, the other, the, what well, the big factor in the next 30, 40 years uh, is going to be the rise in healthcare costs. <coughs> um, in terms of, say, the American budget, um, there's a, you know, the American budget situation at the moment is actually bloody desperate, but it could be sorted. I mean, all it needs is you know, the courage to take politically tough decisions to cut spending and raise taxes or one or the other or some mixture of the two. Um, Social Security, for example, is, um, you know, is fixable if you're prepared to do things like raise retirement ages, uh, raise payroll taxes, cut entitlements, that kind of thing. But healthcare costs are not... Uh, there's no way that the kind of escalation of healthcare costs in most developed countries can be contained. And um, because the lobby to have them is so powerful, there's a tendency in the long run for healthcare costs to crowd out uh, other forms of public spending. Uh, and this is going to make the whole financing of the welfare state in most countries increasingly difficult problematic. And it's actually a big problem. It's a problem even if you have a completely privatised system, because the rising healthcare costs is a problem no matter what system you have. I would argue it's less of a problem if you have a free market system, but it's still a problem. And the underlying, the problem is, that the reason why it's so, uh, you know, in, difficult to deal with, is that what drives it 
uh, is something that's very hard to you know find a solution for, and that is not as people commonly think um, modern technology, because in medical technology, just like any other area of technology, things that are introduced at very high cost uh, tend to be reduced in price, not as rapidly over time, not as rapidly in the medical area as they are in other sectors because of the heavy state involvement and the lack of market competition, but it still happens. Uh, but the thing that the really big factor in healthcare costs is nursing costs for the elderly. And full-time nursing care for people in the last you know, six to nine months of life, or the long-term uh, chronically unwell when they're elderly, is really, really expensive. And there's no way you could really make it less expensive because of what they call the Beaumont effect, mm -hmm. which is that you can't raise the productivity of people in that kind of occupation the way you can in other areas like manufacturing, most obviously. And so there's a long-term tendency, given that we have an aging population for healthcare costs to go up in pretty much every country. I myself think that the only long-term solution is actually to find ways of curing aging. And that, that is, in fact, what will happen. Early death. Well, that is the other solution. One solution is that we go to the world of Logan's Run. Um, for those of you who remember what that was, one of the worst science fiction programs ever made. Uh, but um, I, I think that's one solution. But I think what will happen, in fact, is that there will be more and more research done into alleviating the symptoms of the aging process. And what this will lead to over the next 20 to 30 years is the gradual solving of a lot of the aging problems. So I, I, I constantly tell people of you know, the age of these young chaps here that they're, they're probably going to live to about seven or 800. Mm. Um, which will be, you know, because what, what is going to happen, I think, is that it will become possible to arrest the aging process in about 30 years' time. It will probably not become possible, unfortunately, to reverse it, because that's a whole order of magnitude more difficult. What they um, seem to be doing now is giving you pills, which increases the aging process, like makes you feel more docile, yes. and prolongs your life. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Uh, and also, you know, keep, it prevents you from dying from the bad effects of aging, but doesn't stop them being debilitating, which is one of the reasons why there's this constant escalation in healthcare costs. Mm -hmm. Now what that means is I think the next 20 or 30 years you're going to have really, really severe difficulties. I think ultimately it will be resolved, but it does mean that public finances all over the developed world are going to be under really severe strain in the next 20 to 30 years. Uh, oh. And they, you know, the politicians, I, I don't envy them quite frankly, they've got a really difficult job. Oliver? I was just going to uh, tell you when you, you were talking before about people preferring to go back to a, um, as it was a traditionally envisaged uh, uh, Type of system based on paying in. Mm. Maybe uh, there'll be a pressure to go back to the system where you have uh, children and have their parents rather than. Uh... Well, arguably, but I do remember when I was living in the United States in the early 1990s, um, somebody. The Pew Center, I think he was, did a big opinion poll survey of Americans' attitudes towards Social Security and retirement. It was a very good survey. What they did was they asked this you know, big representative across sample of Americans, do you think you're paying too much into Social Security and payroll tax? And the overwhelming answer was, yes, we're paying far too much. What they then did to say was, okay, suppose that the alternative were to uh, have your parents come to live with you how much would you be prepared to pay? <laughs> and the outcome of the poll was because Americans were prepared to, what was the expression, pay, shoulder any burden, pay any price, rather than have their mum and dad come and live with them. Or, or, or even worse, have their partner's mum and dad come and live with them. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think that's, that's the underlying fact. That's, you know, um, you know, advocating that uh, you know, filial piety is the solution to the problem, is, is the probably the quickest way there is to lose an election, so I don't see that happening. However, you are going the other way around, aren't you? Yes. The, the, the uh, aging middle age are still living with their parents. Well, indeed, this is constantly <laughs> yeah, happening. That's, well, the yes. that's, that's the other way around. Because there's no job security. <laughs> yes. Pat? Yeah, um, just a, a couple of the aging thing. I mean, I think it's going to get a lot worse. I think you're wrong there. It's going to get a lot worse when it gets better with obesity and so forth. You mean in terms of the death rate? You mentioned, you mentioned the wind and so forth. I mean, the inactivity they get from that leading to all these different diseases they get. Now, even, even as youngsters, before they, before they reach old age. I mean, whereas we were a lot more active, physically active. But a lot of, a lot of the, the health costs now, at least in Britain, a lot of it is skyrocketing through artificial means. This is true, yes. Yeah, I mean, just a simple example. The deal Patricia Hewitt had with the British Medical Association, I mean, that doubled 
GP uh, salaries, GP yeah. GP salaries. Um, now, I, I know it's well, they were well over £130,000 on energy in, in uh, London, I say Greater London, yeah. a GP salary. And I thought that was for working three days, but I, 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 I've been told since that that's for working two days. Something like that, salary. yes. I mean, the, the BMA really played a blinder in terms well, yeah, of I the... Mean, uh, there, there was a chap on the radio I, I listened to about a year ago, and he retired, and he, you know, he was saying, he said, that, that they thought every day was Christmas now. Yeah. Just, they've got so much money, and they do, do so little for it. Yeah. He said, it's absolutely phenomenal. But it's, it's also, it also knocks down to the nurses as well, uh, who get huge salaries. Yeah. You, you don't hear much about this, but a lot of this was simply artificially inflated by the Patricia Hewitt. Hmm. Uh, this is true, and that's part of a wider phenomenon. Um, I mean, it's true that there are other things which are artificially inflating healthcare costs in many countries. One of them is basically the way that the system is set up and run to benefit medical professionals. Uh, a huge amount of the, the benefits are captured by doctors and nurses, basically, above all senior doctors. Uh, this is particularly true in, in the US, but it's equally true here and in other countries. Um, another thing is the um, persistence, is the way in which, particularly in the United States, but also here, medical healthcare policy encourages everything to be done in really large hospitals. Um, in fact, I mean, my own, my own view is that if you look at both the economics and the technology, it no longer really makes sense to have hospitals. Uh, that it makes much more sense to have clinics to deal, specialist clinics to deal with most healthcare conditions. Hospitals are actually a very bad idea generally on health grounds because they're very unhealthy places, they always have been, uh, because they're full of sick people. And the other thing that's happening as well, um, is, which is also that, is, um, is my personal view of mine, I'm not sure most, not everyone here will agree with me, um, is the artificial inflation of uh, drug costs due to excessive intellectual property rights uh, and the way these are enforced, particularly by the US Patent Office these days. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I mean, that's all true. You know, um, Dean Baker, who is a kind of uh, lefty economist, but an interesting one, um, has a, a couple of papers about this where he talks about the way in which there are a number of policies, such as uh, the policies of the FDA in terms of drug legal, you know, licensing and so on, the way in which the United States government refuses to allow trained medical personnel to immigrate into the United States to work there. Uh, the way in which the American Medical Association controls the supply of doctors through its control of the medical schools, all of which have the effect of enormously increasing the cost of healthcare in the US above what it what it really ought to be. Mm. And that's a common problem. John Stossel did a very interesting piece about uh, he believed that the cost of the US of healthcare was, was inflated artificially by um, insurance. It is indeed, sort of um, very much so. Too many third party payers. I mean, as recently as 1960, uh, something like 80% of all American health care was paid for out of pocket. Um, we forget just how recent it is that there's been this explosion of health um, healthcare insurance. And, and as people have said, again, Dean Baker actually is very good on this, it, it's, it's a crazy way to do things. You know, would you use your motor car insurance to pay for your, uh, like, your, your petrol bill? Well, no. Obviously not. You can see why you would do. It would be insane. But that's what the... Uh, Healthcare system was set up to be like, but that's for historical, accidental reasons. Essentially, it could be reformed. Indeed, it could be, except that it, there's you know very very difficult you know to do it. So the tendency has been for the states to add more and more requirements. If you more and more mandates, exactly. Yes. I mean, that's one of the reasons why the, the the you know healthcare reform in the United States was completely insane. On you know even on a from a left wing perspective, it was completely nuts because here you are, you're worried that. No, working class and low income Americans can't afford health care. So, insurance that is. So, what do you do? You force them to buy it. What? You know, <laughs> that really doesn't make sense you know, under any kind of um, you know, position. Uh, unless it is that you're looking to get lots of campaign donations from the insurance companies, of course. Mm -hmm. In which case, it makes perfect sense. Obama got a huge, huge bum from the young. Those are going to gain from this health policy. Yes, indeed. As indeed did most of the other members of Congress. Oh. Yeah, so. Well, I suppose it's on the same track. I, I don't put a word in for the old and the obese, <laughs> if it's impossible. <laughs> I speak for both parties. Yeah? I'm working on both of them. Um, in the same direction. I would like to point out, the speaker isn't guilty of this, I'm sure, that um, 
It's taken for granted that there's a kind of labour theory of value at work here, or a labour generation of value, such that um, the old and the stout have to be kept alive by the working young. Because in fact, if governments didn't inflate away your savings, hmm. and tax them away as you will, you would have land and capital, such that you would have an income when you retire. You wouldn't call it retirement. You would have a source of income. You may occasionally feel like not working. Yes. Uh, there's, no, there's no reason to suppose, to suppose that only living labour can look after the not working. This is, uh, yeah, this is, this is true. Very good point. Well, of course, it was made at length when we had that talk on pensions from Terry Arthur. I missed it. Oh, did you? Yes. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, is there any more? People who want to... Well, on a lighter note, I, I heard a, a podcast of some American students and uh, the lecturers are giving, giving the problem of entitlements and the costs of health care and this. Uh, spontaneously, the, the teenage audience shouted out, kill the old people. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yes, that's right. they, they, well, they do that for fun anyway. It's the fun, the fun involved in it, sadly. And they, they, you know, they, as Shakespeare said, you know, we're proud aged and youth can't mm-hmm. very much get on with each other. <laughs> Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Well, thank you very much indeed, Stephen. Okay. Okay.